Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. In order to better understand the microwave background, our analysis now turns to the causes of radiative emission and absorption. In this video, I had emphasized that the production of a thermal spectrum requires the presence of a vibrational lattice. That video can be found in our CMB playlist. A lattice in hexagonal planar arrangement is most likely to be required in order to provide the proper emission. The hexagonal planar lattice is the lattice of graphite and soot, which are the best known natural black bodies. This is one of the reasons why the lattice is the only reasonable naturally occurring lattice for the solar photosphere. If we are to account for the monopole of the CMB as detected by the Ferris horn, then we must find a lattice somewhere. Unlike the cosmologists, we cannot create the spectrum from mathematical arguments and thermal equilibrium. A physical mechanism is required. This is a consequence of recognizing that Kirchhoff's law of thermal emission is false. Sky Scholar has created 13 videos on Kirchhoff's law, which are now included in a playlist. Over the years, I have received many comments from individuals who are incredulous relative to the idea that the microwave background was produced by the oceans of the earth. Arguments often take the form of, hey, oceans are nearly at 300 Kelvin on average, so there's no way that they produced a 3 Kelvin background. Oftentimes, these remarks are made by people who seem well trained in physics and chemistry, so it is regrettable that they did not consider the subject further before pronouncing judgment. In the next couple of videos, I hope to further clarify the issues. Previously, I have given these two talks on water and they are now linked below. You may wish to have a look. At this time, we build on these concepts. We begin by considering what causes radiative absorption and emission in the first place. As a spectroscopist, one first studies the absorption of simple diatomic molecules such as hydrogen chloride. Here is a depiction of the vibrational rotational absorption spectrum for that molecule. A diatomic molecule has only one mode of vibration along the intranuclear axis. In addition, it can undergo rigid body rotation. The combination of these two effects leads to vibrational rotational spectra. In order to produce vibrational rotational lines, a molecule must possess a dipole moment. The hydrogen chloride molecule has a dipole moment of 1.08 Debye. Conversely, the hydrogen molecule has no dipole moment. That is why molecular hydrogen never displays vibrational rotational lines. This helps to explain why the hydrogen molecule is so difficult to detect in astrophysics. It is observed only through the 21 centimeter line, which is produced in a hydrogen atom when an electron spin flips from being parallel to anti-parallel to the proton spin. Hydrogen in astrophysics is not detected through vibrational rotational modes. Now when one examines the absorption spectrum of hydrogen chloride, one can see how the molecule is able to absorb at specific frequencies. The region on the left of the spectrum is called the P branch, the center is called the Q branch, and the right region is called the R branch. In order to fully understand this spectrum, one needs to turn to quantum mechanics as taught in upper level chemistry or physics courses. You can learn more about this spectrum if you are interested at these sites. For our purposes, we wish to consider the hydrogen chloride molecule much like weights on a spring and use harmonic analysis. One can think of the problem in terms of quantized energy levels within a potential energy well. Weaker vibrations are found at the bottom of the well and strong vibrations at the top. If vibrations are too large, the molecule will break apart. That is why the potential energy well moves towards infinite displacement on the upper right of the diagram. In this simple figure, we depicted the atoms as weights on a spring. The force of the bond between the atoms is expressed with this equation, where force is equal to the force constant K for the spring and X refers to the displacement from the equilibrium position. So large displacements require more force. The potential energy of this system can be described with this equation, where E represents the potential energy of the molecule, K is once again the force constant, and X is the displacement from equilibrium. 
With such simplified analysis, one can learn a great deal about hydrogen chloride, including the value of its force constant. In any case, this spectrum of hydrogen chloride is very different than what is observed in condensed matter, because in condensed matter, the quantum states are so packed that the absorption can be continuous. A diatomic molecule has access to far fewer quantum states, and that is why we see distinct absorption lines in hydrogen chloride. Now it is time to turn to water. You recall that in water, one has a single oxygen atom bound to two hydrogen atoms. Those two bonds have a specific name in chemistry. They are called hydroxyl bonds. Bond energy is a measure of the amount of energy required to break a bond and dissociate it into its component atoms. It is a measure of the strength of the hydroxyl bond, which is on the order of 119 kilocalories per mole, as one can learn here. Once again, we can represent the water molecule using weights on a spring. Here is a schematic representation of the spectrum of water vapor. There are two prominent features. The first, near 1600 reciprocal centimeters, corresponds to the HOH bending mode of water as the molecule slightly alters its 104.5 degree angle. The second group of lines, centered near 3700 reciprocal centimeters, corresponds to the OH stretching mode for water, similar to what we saw in hydrogen chloride. Now what happens when one takes two water molecules and brings them together such as this? The bond making the linkage is called a hydrogen bond. It is linking two water molecules together by forming a weak interaction between a hydrogen atom in one molecule and an oxygen atom in the other. The resulting complex is called a water dimer and is known to exist in a humid atmosphere. I treated this question in detail in this paper. Note that in the water dimer, the hydroxyl bond in one molecule and the hydrogen bond to the oxygen atom of the second molecule share the same hydrogen atom. If we treat this as two separate systems, we can see that when the hydrogen atom moves within the axis, one bond gets longer and the other shortens. Namely, the change in position for one bond is x, while for the other it is minus x. In liquid water, the motion of the hydrogen atom is not exactly along the internuclear axis, and it can be displaced from that axis slightly through dynamic bending. However, for our purposes, we can make the approximation that the motion is uniquely along the internuclear axis. Now, in order to gain further insight into this problem, we can treat each bond separately as harmonic oscillators. That is because they have dramatically different energies, as we shall soon see. For instance, we saw that the bond energy of the hydroxyl bond is on the order of 119 kilocalories per mole. How about the bond energy of the hydrogen bond we just created? Well, in the water dimer, the hydrogen bond is much stronger than that reported for liquid water. The hydrogen bond in the water dimer has been estimated to have a bond energy of about 5 kilocalories per mole, as can be seen here. The water dimer has a fundamental frequency omega of 143 reciprocal centimeters in the far infrared. Note that the Firis horn on the COBE satellite also sampled the far infrared region. In any case, we can use this equation to estimate the force constant of the hydrogen bond in the dimer, where C corresponds to the speed of light. Mu is the reduced mass for the dimer, which is given by this expression. In the reduced mass expression, one is multiplying the masses of interest in the numerator and adding them in the denominator. Avogadro's number is used to convert the mass for a single water molecule. For our problem, the reduced mass is equal to 1.495 times 10 to the minus 23rd grams per molecule. When considering the fundamental frequency of 143 reciprocal centimeters, this results in a force constant of 0.108 times 10 to the fifth dynes per centimeter. The force constant for the hydroxyl bond can easily be obtained from the literature. It corresponds to 8.45 times 10 to the fifth dynes per centimeter. Now we can write these expressions for the energy contained within both the hydrogen bond and the hydroxyl bonds, where K1 corresponds to the force constant that we have just calculated for the hydrogen bond, and K2 was obtained from the literature for the hydroxyl bond. Because the hydrogen atom which forms the translinear bond is shared by both the hydrogen bond and the hydroxyl bond, the distance squared actually is common to both equations, since x1 is equal to minus x2. Thus, since the distances are the same, we can immediately get that E1 over E2 is equal to the ratio of the force constants as the square of the displacements are equal and cancel out. Consequently, in the dimer, one expects the hydroxyl bond 
to be emitting at an energy which is about 80 times greater than that for the hydrogen bond in the dimer. Now we can then use this simple equation which relates the energy to temperature. In this case, E represents the energy, K sub B is Boltzmann's constant, and T is the temperature in Kelvin. As a result, since the hydroxyl bond has a force constant which is 80 times stronger, the energy that the system can hold corresponds to a temperature which is 80 fold greater. Next, we can refine this a little. The hydrogen bond in the water dimer has been estimated to have a bond energy of about 5 kilocalories per mole as we saw above. But in liquid water, the hydrogen bond energy is much weaker on the order of only 1.5 plus or minus 0.5 kilocalories per mole as one can learn in this paper. As a result, one might expect that the hydrogen bond in liquid water might emit with an energy which is somewhere between 80 and 240 times lower than for the hydroxyl bond. This is the problem in assigning the microwave background to the cosmos. When water has a temperature of 300 Kelvin, it is predicted that the hydrogen bond is emitting somewhere in the electromagnetic spectrum such that it is manifesting a temperature which is 80 to 240 times lower. One can now readily see that the observed 2.7 Kelvin temperature associated with the microwave background falls within this range. It is clear that the hydrogen bond has a profound effect on the behavior of water in the liquid state. Just consider what is happening to the dipole moment of water. In the free molecule, water has a dipole moment of about 1.83 Debye, which is actually substantial. However, in the condensed state, such as ice 1H, the electric dipole moment increases dramatically to 3.1 Debye. This speaks to the cooperation of the hydrogen bonding network in the condensed state. Now, how do we bring all this together? Well, when we think of thermal emission of a substance, we typically deal with a single system because all the bonds in the substance have about the same bond energy, which is telling us something about bond strength. Just look at this table of bond energies for various bonds. The values are all pretty much the same. They might differ by a factor of two or three, but not much more. That is one reason why infrared measurements of temperature work so well. All substances around us have bond strengths which are about of the same order and their principal absorption and emission will be in the infrared. This is something never discussed when one considers thermal emission, but the reality remains that it is lattice vibrations which produce thermal photons and those vibrations depend on bond strengths as we just saw. But when one considers water, the bond strength between the hydroxyl bond and the hydrogen bond are vastly different. As a result, when one thinks of water, one should actually be thinking about two separate systems, not just one. One needs to consider the hydroxyl bond first and then consider how the hydrogen bond is behaving. Energetically, we are dealing with two separate systems and that is why cosmologists simply fail to properly consider the impact of water in their experiments. Next, let us consider the water system in terms of the equipartition of energy principle. You recall that we covered equipartition in this video. In a simple gas such as hydrogen chloride, the equipartition principle states that the energy of the system will be equally distributed amongst all possible modes including translational, vibrational and rotational. However, I have already emphasized that equipartition does not occur in condensed matter. Things are much more complicated in such systems. So now let us think of the two bonding systems in water as receptacles for energy and consider how this energy is partitioned. The hydrogen bonding network is very weak and therefore can contain only very little energy. We can think of that energy as placed in a container. Next we have the hydroxyl bond system and it can hold much more energy so we give that a much larger container. So what happens when the energy enters the water system? Well at the beginning the energy can enter both bonding systems because we have two containers. For a while at least we can have equipartition. But as the energy continues to be delivered to the water system, the hydrogen bonding container rapidly becomes full. It can contain no more energy, so all the new energy must now enter the container for the hydroxyl bond and equipartition begins to break down. As for the hydrogen bonding container with increased energy into the system, it might actually get a little smaller as slightly less hydrogen bonds can form in liquid than in ice for instance. As a rule, while there are about 4 hydrogen bonds per water molecule in ice, there are perhaps only 3.8 or so at room temperature in liquid water. In any case, the size of the hydrogen bond container will not change much with changes in temperature. That explains why the monopole of the microwave background is independent of seasonal variations or changes in oceanic temperatures. 
the amount of hydrogen bonding in water does not change very much as a function of the temperature range of interest and the hydrogen bonds that do exist will always be restricted to holding a very limited amount of energy. So seasonal variations are essentially unable to affect the system which is responsible for the emission of interest. The next question is what is the most probable structure for liquid water? Remember that we care about the lattice structure because we need it to account for the thermal spectrum since Kirchhoff's law is false. So what is the structure of liquid water? It is certain that water has a fleeting lattice in the liquid state and that the hydrogen bonds are constantly breaking and rapidly reforming. Still, it has been argued that the oxygen-hydrogen-oxygen bond angle in liquid water deviates only slightly from the linearity found in ordinary ice, or ice 1H. Here is a quote. The H bond network of liquid water is, in the average, the same as that of ice. Have a look at the structure of ordinary hexagonal ice, or ice 1H. The first point to note is that the structure is indeed hexagonal in nature. That is what the little h represents. In this arrangement, the oxygen atoms have a tetragonal symmetry, which is said to be maintained in liquid water at the expense of tremendous dynamic bending of the hydrogen bond. So the hydrogen bond experiences tremendous dynamic bending, but on average, it retains the position it has in ice 1H, as one can learn in this reference. Now have a look at this representation of ice 1H. Note how the hexagonal planes are arranged and how the oxygen atoms are somewhat puckered away from the plane. But now examine the hydrogen atoms in the hexagonal ring. It is clear that these are much closer to lying in a single plane. The arrangement of water is in fact very much like graphite, and that is the problem for the cosmologist. The structure of liquid water does in fact possess exactly the lattice we need, namely hexagonal planar. We will return to this in the next video. It has also been argued that at the surface of water, the structure of water does indeed assume a hexagonal planar form called easy water as you can see here. This forms the basis of the work by Professor Jerry Polak and you can learn more about this structure in his book. Relative to liquid water, it is also instructive to examine its infrared spectrum. If you examine the spectrum of a one micrometer thick sample of water, three principal features can be visualized and they are all related to the hydroxyl bond. First, we have a component linked to hindered rotation at about 700 reciprocal centimeters. Then comes the water bending mode at about 1630 reciprocal centimeters. Finally, we have the OH stretch at about 3400 reciprocal centimeters. Nothing is seen in the IR relative to the hydrogen bond stretching mode. However, one can notice its effect in specialized experiments involving the substitution of deuterium for hydrogen in deuterium oxide, the analog of water, or in the study of water clusters. Still, these represent slight shifts in the lines. The stretching mode of the hydrogen bond itself is not seen in the infrared. Remember that the bond strength is weak for the hydrogen bond and the force constant we just determined would place its vibrational mode in the far IR or microwave region exactly where the ferrous horn of the COBE satellite measured in detecting the microwave background. Now before we close for today, there is another problem to consider when thinking of water and the oceans of the earth, namely that they possess ions. Sodium chloride is well known to exist in seawater. In fact, seawater is about 0.12 molar in sodium chloride. So how does that affect our structure of water when water is 110 molar in hydrogen? It turns out that the presence of sodium chloride at these concentrations has very little effect on the structure of water as one can learn in these two papers. Well, that is all for now. We will return to water in our next clip. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.